All right. So this lecture, we're going to go over queuing and adjustments. Um, and although you're going to find, I have access to give you two segments of all of the pieces that you're going to find in all this material today, it is really helpful to hear it all at once and understand conceptually how it all makes sense together. And then when you're given these individual videos, they are so much easier to be like, that makes sense as to why this is happening. So I'm going to uh, dive in here. Google internship, boom. All right, so <clears throat> queuing and adjustments. There are two different forms, right? So you have what we call ITMs, in the moment coaching, right? In the moment queuing. And it is what is happening when you are literally able to make a change in a client's motion before they complete the number of reps, right? So know there's a ton of stuff on here. Please don't just start like reading away. It'll confuse you more. Just listen and then I'll highlight. Um, and then the second thing is called the after the moment adjustment. So think about it like this. The in the moment cue is not any different than when a boxer, kickboxer, MMA fighter is out there in the ring and they've got one coach that is back here. Now they're in the moment fighting, but they're able to still hear what their coach is saying. You know, like that coach is able to see what they cannot see as they were literally in the fight. So your client may literally be in the fight with their kettlebell, their barbell, whatever it is, and you're able to see things that they can't. So they might be able to tell your fighter, like, he's looking weak, go for the ribs. It's the equivalent of saying, like, let's drive your chest up and explode out the hole or whatever the case may be, right? And then you've got the after the moment adjustments. I want you to think of this as a football coach trying to give feedback to his quarterback. Now, his quarterback goes out, he's about to get sacked, and he sees it coming a little too late because he forgot to rotate. He throws the ball away. All is good. He still gets hit. He still goes down. Do you think that coach was yelling across the field like, here comes the sack? You know, pivot and look. No, absolutely not. Can't get in the moment queuing and coaching in that regard. It comes to when that that NFL player, the uh, <laughs> quarterback, just lost my word there, steps off the field, and then they have a debrief. They break down the play. This is why they review film in a lot of sports. It is a – opportunity to look at things after the fact, have deeper conversation, do some cu curious base exploring and come to a solution, right? That's the difference. You need to do both. If you can do both with all aspects of a client, it's going to be really good. So what are ITMs? They are simply meant to be quick to the point and focused cues. And that is the thing to remember. So often as coaches, especially as you hear me talk, we love, we love to talk. We love to give guidance. We love to give feedback. We love to give adjustments. We love to give advice. You are trying to do as little of that as possible and be as succinct and individual and poignant as possible to elicit as fast of a response to a change as you possibly can. So I want you to think about it like this. If you've got a client doing eight reps, first one isn't going to look so hot. It's just kind of normal. Second one looks better. Three through seven, usually pretty good. Eight maybe falls off. Now, I'm not going to give a cue on the first one and be like, ooh, that looks awful. Like, you know, Jackie, drive your knees out and your chest up high. No, I'm going to let that first rep kind of happen as long as there's nothing to fear from a bad standpoint of like, I need to interject to keep that person safe. And then I'm going to like find the one thing as quickly as I possibly can that they need feedback on. Or give you a second example. You're walking across the room and you only catch reps three and four. Do you wait so that they're just like, teaching their body that pattern in a wrong way or in an inappropriate way or inefficient way? Or do you give a coaching cue as quickly and as poignantly as you possibly can? The latter, I would hope. If you're just sitting there in silence, you're missing an opportunity. Every single rep is building that pattern so that neuromuscular action thinks this is what we do, this is how we do it, and this is how it's always supposed to be done. And so if you can break and pattern interrupt that as soon as possible, we're gonna be more successful, right? <clears throat> So with our in-the-moment cues, the best is the thing to do is just use two-word phrases, right? Two-word phrases works extremely well, which is why we then apply that into a four-step cueing process. So let's go through that process. Then we'll go back to uh, after the moment. So uh, first thing you do is you're going to say the client's name. And if you don't know their name, try and get to know it as soon as you possibly can. Because as we've talked about in the past on other lectures, the favorite word in the English language for us is whatever our name is. And probably any, any language, not just English language. It literally is the one thing that we are attuned to listening for that snaps us out. So if I've got a million things happening off in the gym and there's chaos and all these kind of things happening, 
I want to hear, Joseph, I'm going to tune in to wherever that is coming from. And don't forget, if I'm doing a heavy squat with eight reps, I'm probably also thinking like, all right, tighten my lats, big breath in, chest up and wide, don't arch too much from the back, spread the floor, break the bar, like all of these cues, right? They are, <laughs> pardon me, they are momentous. And so when we have all of these amazing cues that are going through our head, and then on top of that, we're like, oh, did I leave the garage door open? Do I got to pick up my kid from school today? Nope, my wife's doing that. Like, there's so many things that are happening. And so if I just hear Joseph, I'm instantly tuned in a little bit. The second piece of this that happens is now I'm going to give that verbal cue, right? Two ears, very important. I'm going to give a verbal cue. And if possible, it's only going to be two words long, right? Two words long. Let's jump to this list below. I think this is really helpful. So when we're giving in the moment cues, we're going to try to have the body part be first and the direction that we want second. So what do I mean by that, right? <clears throat> Head, body part, direction, back. So if you're doing a side plank, right? And I'm like, Joseph, I pay attention, right? And I'm like, head back, Joseph, head back. Joseph, head back. I use three words, name, direction, and body part. That was it. And I got the response. Chest up. Joseph, knees out. Joseph, soft elbows. Joseph, soft knees, right? These are very simple things that we can go for, right? The second most common that we want to do is still trying to be two word phrases, but it is an emphasis on what we're trying to achieve and then the body part of the movement. So that could be something like snap your hips, exhale hard, right? It is still two words. It is driving a position. It is driving momentum with an emphasis that I am aiming for as quickly as possible. That is how simple that is. Now, the difference between just saying the name and giving that cue once, what I will do to make sure that I am getting as much of a response as possible is I will repeat that phrase two to three times with escalating urgency. And so what I mean by that is we hear our name what? But I'm also thinking all those cues is I got 200 and something pounds on my back. Then I hear knees out. It's not going to register right away. But if I say, Joseph, knees out, knees out, knees out, knees out. As I'm escalating in voice, and it's creating a sense of urgency, right? And when we feel like there's a sense of urgency, we're more likely to respond. This is not any different than when you're driving the car, right? You're focused on all the things you got to do while you're driving. And for some reason, somebody cuts in front of you, right? D caves, somebody cuts in front of you. Something goes wrong that is outside your scope of view. And your passenger who's right there is trying to protect you. And they go, stop, 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 stop. And they like literally put their hand towards your chest and they yell, stop, 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 right? It escalates. That sense of urgency is what brings us in to be hyper aware as quickly as possible because that emphasis is so clear. So by the third time you've said knees out, you've actually corrected my rep before I'm even up because I'm able to take that information, process it really quickly and do something with it. I'm able to think exactly what you want from me. And within that one rep, I fixed it as opposed to you coming over and be like, hey, hey, Joseph, so let's work on um, what we want. No, direct, short, quick emphasis. So come up with all of your two word cues. We do have videos on every single one of those that I will provide for you but hopefully that makes sense in the fact that it needs to be poignant. From there, step three is giving them a physical cue. If you can give a physical cue by stating the adjustment and where you're going to make that contact with their body, as long as you've asked permission first, that's the next thing, right? Then you're gonna immediately be able to guide that person into a safe position. So <clears throat> let's look at something like this. This was our example from earlier today. Not drink coffee, but I needed a sip. So imagine, I'm pulling you down. That's right. Eh, that'll work. Right. So one of our coaches was demonstrating an RDL by sliding out in front with that bar way out in front to try and get the other coaches to cue them the right way. This is on purpose, right? Coming up from here, right? Now, first thing you would want to be able to do is circle around to see, because maybe from this angle, especially on a camera at a barbell, this would look great. But then from the side, you're like, wow, he's using a lot of lower back because that bar is so far out in front, right? And so, of course, I would love to be like, Joseph, pull the bar against your shins. Pull, 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 right? But that is a harder cue to make sense. That is a harder cue to adjust. So I would literally slide in, right? I would wedge one hand behind the knee, one hand into the hip, right? And I would 
force the hips back. And if I force the hips back, the bar will just follow. I would give a physical cue. If my client is squatting, right? This is very excessive on purpose. <laughs> but then I'm like, knees out, knees out, knees out. Pushing to me, pushing to me, pushing to me. There you go. Keep pushing into me, right? I'm going to give some form of physical adjustment and cue as quickly as I possibly can to the safest area. Now, how do you go about doing this? First, you ask permission. So you need to have gotten permission first. Second thing you do is you don't ever like put your whole hands on people unless it is in a very safe position and you already know. So I would never put my hand onto someone like that unless it was for maybe their shoulder blade. And I'm teaching their shoulder blade how to slide, right? If I'm holding with fingertips, it's gonna be maybe on a kneecap or on a shoulder girdle or on an elbow. Anything that is gripping, I'm going to avoid at all costs. I'm a big fan of the tap with the knuckles. So if I need to address some client's glute, right? I am literally gonna be like, all right, and I'm gonna tap from here, right? I want you to squeeze, 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 squeeze. I do light taps. There's no like pressure. There's no feeling of a grip or what could be simulated as gripping, grabbing, or holding off. It is tapping outside of the hand, maybe fingertips if I need to, like ribs, 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 down, 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 right? As much as I possibly can, I'm keeping it contact free, but still driving force. And that, that makes a huge difference, okay? So it's safe for everything. And then the last thing I'm gonna do, whether I did physical cues or not, so I'm gonna validate. I'm gonna validate by saying, yeah, there it is. Nice job, good job, whatever it is. You're progressing, right? So it always has a positive influence. It's always projection coming across that way, but it's never going to be alive. So if that client really isn't doing a great job yet, because you're giving them one cue to focus on, right? And you don't wanna inflate some kind of false statement and telling them they're doing great. And then they go train somewhere else and somebody's like, wow, your squat looks awful. They're like, what? Yeah, I mean, I know Coach Joseph like fixed this with me, but it, he said it looked great. But if I didn't say it looked great and I just said, yes, that's progressing so good. That's exactly what we want. And I'm like, progressing? And like, well, yeah, there's a few other things, but I just want you to work on that for now. Makes sense. They feel positive. They feel reinforced. They know there's opportunity for growth and it's not going to force anything else. So just a reminder, you're going to drop their name. You're going to give that verbal cue, whatever that two word phrase is, two to three times with an escalation of urgency as much as you possibly can, a physical cue when you're close by or when that is going to elicit a faster change than anything else. Then you're going to validate with wherever they are at. So it's that full circle, right? Okay. So Last couple of pieces that I think are really important here. So key elements to remember, competence comes from confidence, right? If the more you cue, the better it's going to be. And the more that you just are willing to get in there, right? And be like, yeah, I want you to do this, or I need this from you. Let's try this, right? Here's what I'm seeing. The more you just dive in, the better it's going to be. The more it's like, uh, you let's, uh, well, your shoulders, like that timidness, they're never going to buy into the change that you're trying to make. And then it's going to be like, well, what do you want from me? I don't, I'm confused. Right. And so we want to have confidence with what we're doing and confidence comes from our competence. It comes from us doing it over and over and over again. Right. So again, be assertive, right? Lead and trust your gut. If you think something needs to be done and cued, jump in there, but do it from a real positive place, which is simply at, you know, stating their name, stating the exercise adjustment that you want to make. Right. And then making it from a body part and a direction standpoint, right? And then just simply validating after you've made that adjustment. All right, cool. So those are our in the moment cues. So beyond that, we've got our wonderful, and this is what it tells you to do, it's role play, right? So be able to go through all of these elements, be able to give a two to three cues based on all of these things. Actually, before I go into the after the moment uh, adjustments, I want to reflect on something, right? So <clears throat> if you watch the entire lecture, or the little section on the five steps of how to demo. So the better you are at demoing exercises, the better you're going to be at cueing and fixing exercises. And why is that? Because if you followed our demoing process, you have the tool, right? You have the position, you have the um, specific modifier. I even had to look for a second there. I can say them so fast and rapidly when I'm doing exercises, but then you actually break down the terminology of what they are and it's a little hard. So you have the tool, the position, the specific modifier, and then whatever the base exercise is, right? So if I have a, let's say, dumbbell kickstand RDL, okay? So we have a dumbbell kickstand RDL. Let's go through it. I'm 
I'm going to go through actually demonstrating this exercise. I'm like, hey, so we've got a dumbbell kickstand already out. So we're definitely targeting the hamstring, mainly of the leg that is flat. You're going to get about 70% there, about 30% on the other leg. It's just there to support you. You're holding this nice and tight to your dumbbell so your chest stays up. I want you to do a big inhale as you push your butt back like you're closing a door with your butt. And then drive on up through the hips. Squeeze your abs and your glute nice and hard. Big inhale on the way down. Feel that stretch of the hamstring. Drive on up. Squeeze the glute. Squeeze the abs hard at the top. Just do me a favor. Make sure you're not rounding from your lower back. We want to think that chest up so we keep it in our glute and hamstring, not in our back. Finish strong. Squeeze tight. So what did I do there? Right? I stated what the name of the exercise was. I tapped the area that I wanted them to go. I gave two to three cues of what I was trying to get out of them from that move, the one thing that I want them to avoid, and then I fully circled back and gave them that one positive cue to finish on, right? Which is why we call it our five-step process. Why did that help me with cueing and correcting a client? Because I've simply just said the cues that I'm then going to re-cue when things break down because they're the most common cues of what goes wrong. Learn to demo, learn to talk, you'll be better at this. So what I mean is I told them, right? I want you to sit, put 70% of your pressure on one foot. Your other foot's there just to keep you upright. You're going to push your hips back like you're closing a door, right? So you can be like, hips back. I want you to keep your chest up, right? And I want you to do a big inhale on the way down, exhale on the way up, squeeze glutes and abs. And I was very visual with it. Like I created a tightness, right? Like I'm a two by four at the top or like I'm doing a plank at the top. Those are the two things you would brace in order to create that stability of your pelvis, right? And so because I have just said chest up, I've said exhale on the way up. I've said, I want 70% of your pressure on that side. I'm going to notice if they're shifting. I'm going to, I said, push your hips back like you're closing a door. I've got all of these cues that now I can re-solidify, re-ingrain in their head because they've already heard them once. Now they can hear them again and they're going to make more sense. So that's the beauty, and this is why I want you to really get good at demoing exercises, practice demoing different exercises, and then go through each of these elements, right? Squat, hinge, RDL, push up, whatever, <clears throat> and be able to come up with your cues for each one, all right? Now, let's expand on cues. With cues, before we go into the afternoon, it is best if you can make it relatable. The more relatable you make it, the better it is going to be. And what I mean by that is you want to think, right, with a squat, you're going to try and keep them fairly vertical with that position, right? So I want to say things like, all right, when you're doing your squat, I want your torso and your shins to match with where we're going with this position, right? I want you to imagine sitting to a toilet, right? Oh, you're like, oh, I don't know how to sit to a toilet. Everybody sits to a toilet. That makes sense. Hinging, right? All right, Susie. So we're going to do a hinge, right? I want your feet straight like they're on train tracks. Everybody knows what train tracks are, okay? Oh, you know what? So we're going to keep that width like a train track, Susie, and we're doing that split squat because I really want those feet to be slightly wide apart. I don't want you to be on a balance beam and have to struggle to actually balance. Kick that out a little bit, and now we've got stability. That makes sense. We're doing a push-up. All right, so it's really easy to hyperextend through the back and drop down. I want you to imagine your body as a two by four from your head all the way to your toes. You're locked in, you're rigid, you're straight. Nothing is moving. Your body is just going up and down because of your arms, but you're not gonna bend at all. Imagine yourself as a two by four. Everyone knows what a two by four is. Everybody knows what train tracks are, balance beams. These are all things that you can start to figure out based on all of these moves that make a lot of sense. I always joke, but with some of my guys who are really struggling with kettlebell swings, I literally say, all right, that kettlebell needs to stay above your knees so it's hiking high up into your hips. So it's going to start out in front of you. You're going to hike it like a football, right? Like you're hiking back and forth. Everybody knows what hiking a football is, right? And so when you're hiking it like a football, you got to aim at your special area, guys, right? But let's be smart. We want to get it out of the way. So when we get here, we are going to move our body out of the way. You don't hike in hips and stay right there. So get your body out of the way and then, you know, make a baby. Boom. Everybody knows what that means. And as long as that's obviously with your clientele that is of age, safe, right? That is a, is a crucial thing there. You have to know your audience and know what to say. Don't ever do any of the, to those types of cueings, um, even in jest with any type of youth athlete of any sort. But ultimately, you're trying to find things that make sense, things that are relatable, even if it is something that makes them laugh, it will ingrain it in even that much better, right? So you're making it relatable. 
So hopefully that makes sense. So I challenge you to come up with all your different coaching cues that would be for those things and your little hacks. This is like, what is, when I'm explaining this move, what is this like? This is why I say like, close the car door with your butt. You're like, oh, nice. We've all done that at one point in time in your life. So how do these moves mimic real life? What are they kind of like? Go through, create your list. All right. Wait. All right. After the movement adjustments. So like I said, this is like after a quarterback is gone, he got sacked, he didn't, whatever, he comes off and you're reviewing play film. And that's exactly what's happening. So imagine if you're walking up to a client, you only see the last rep, maybe only the last two, right? You've got a few different things that are really helpful that you can ask. And this is all you're doing. Think about it like this. You're trying to get curious, right? So after you've given some maybe quick feedback, you can do this. Or if you missed any of them and you only saw the last rep or you didn't see any of it, right? Um, your goal is just to identify the changes that you can see if you do see any of them and then be able to talk. But you don't want to just give them feedback right away, right? Unless it's like dire emergency or they just know out the gate, right? But even if they know out the gate, I'm like, you know what you did there? I'm going to give them the opportunity to say yes and to tell me why we don't use mirrors. Beyond that, when our untrained, non-strong individuals are going through moves, we need to remember that our greatest form of awareness in space is our eyesight. When we take our eyesight away, our largest sensory organ in the entire body basically makes up the entire body. It's your muscle. Your muscle is your largest sensory organ. It is sensing feedback from whatever it is that you are doing and it's contact with the floor. It's relationship to the items that are around it because we're focusing both on a stability standpoint, our body's ability to resist force and a strength standpoint, our body's ability to exert force. And so our sensory organ is taking all of this in. So what I'm saying is when we look at from most structural piece of the body, bone, the ligament, the fascia, right? To tendon, to muscle. It took me a while to even think that through, but that's exactly what it is. All the way to central nervous system, i.e. within the brain as well. You have the most malleable, the most functional aspect of the brain that is able to take all of this feedback and give it to the most structural. And so if your sensory organs have not been trained, your muscles are not strong, you're not developed, you are unaware of how your body is moving in space. We all have those clients, we all have those kids that you're like, oh my gosh, they have no idea yet, right? And that's okay. So if I'm telling you a client and trying to have them put their arm over the head and press in this like weird type of caption position, they may not have the sensory organ, the muscle, the awareness of what that is like. And so ultimately by me asking questions, I am allowing them the opportunity to learn where their body lives in space. I am teaching them how to self-diagnose. I'm teaching them to be aware of their body. I'm giving them proprioceptive awareness that they need to be successful without me, without a mirror, without anything. And they can just go and like put a suitcase up and mow the lawn and do all the things and be pain-free, strong, and happy. So I'm just going to question. My job as a coach is not to be like, here's what I saw, Susie, and go through a giant list and destroy her. I'm going to ask questions like, should I take a sip of coffee? Thanks for bearing with me. All right, so question that I love, right, is it's gonna just be how that feel, you know? So that's my go-to type question. Don't even have it listed here right off the gate because it's such a common one that I like to use that it's just almost assumed if you have been around block fitness at any shape or form, you guaranteed have heard the coaches say this. Like, how'd that feel, right? So talk to me, what are we feeling there? You find different ways to say it because if you're coaching the same client, and it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. You don't want to say it over and over and over again the same way after every set. How did that feel? Dude, just ask me. Like, yeah, all right. That looks pretty good. How are you feeling with it? You know? Sweet. So what are you noticing? What are you noticing? Pretty. I'm just getting curious. Yeah. What'd you think of that one? Sweet. Simple, right? I'm a bro's bro. It works. <clears throat> Another way to do it, right? Which rep felt the best? What I love about this because this is an after the moment coaching position, right? Coaching adjustments. So you may not have seen all eight reps that they just did. You may have only seen one. You may have missed some of it and been giving cues. So this is a way to open up the conversation and get them to feel it out. Which rep felt the best? All of a sudden they're going, oh, well, um, number three and four, I think felt the best. Wait, what was it about that? 
Well, I braced pretty hard and I felt the strongest. Yeah, totally. And now I can agree, right? I'm like, yeah, it's sweet. So I definitely felt three and four were the best if I saw it. If I didn't see it, it'd be like, awesome, right? So like, then which ones felt the worst? Cool. And then they'll tell me, well, what do you want to do with that? What's our main focus going to be? What are we going to do next? How are we going to apply that to the next set? They're answering all the questions. You're just giving them the ability to figure it out for themselves. Now, if you saw some of the reps, this is where I would agree, or I would even use the, what I heard you say was, and I would even use what I heard you say was if they didn't, if I didn't even see them. Right. So <clears throat> if I saw it, I'd be like, totally agree. Three and four were really solid. So what I heard you saying is that when you're bracing down nice and tight through your lats on your bench press, and you do a hard exhale, you definitely feel the strongest. Is that correct? So all I would do is I would take what they told me. I would reinterpret it into the cueing conversation and vocabulary that we want them to eventually be able to embody, but by making it simple. So we may say like, all right, so when you lower that bar, I want you to pull your elbows back nice and tight. And keep your chest up. Elbows tight, chest up. Because those would be my two word cues that I can yell from across the room if I need to. Those, that's how I would demo it. That's how I would then cue it if it was in the moment. And then after the moment, they'd be like, well, I noticed like I like didn't keep my back kind of this position. And so it flattened and then I like dumped forward. Cool. So what I heard you say was like, basically as that bar was coming down, right? You weren't able to keep your lats engaged down here so that that bar had a place to go so you could keep the power over your chest and it kind of rounded you. Cool. I just gave them the vernacular. I just taught them that the lats were needed in order to engage that. That's the beautiful thing. That's coaching. But they're the ones that figured it out, right? So <clears throat> that's where you can then request what they're going to do next, okay? So I can often just play this just by like, what row felt worst? What row felt horrible? If I didn't want to ask which felt best. I want to just flip it. You can get to the same conversation every single time, right? So that brings me to number three. You can also just inform the client what you saw, right? Now, this usually works well if you do step two first, but you can just jump in if you need to. If it's a really busy session, you got a lot of clients that you're juggling with, you can be like, hey, Susie, so here's what I noticed, right? It's not, here's what you did wrong. Get that out of your vocabulary now. All right, so you're like totally rounding over in your shoulders, now you're just belittling her. Now you're just making her feel bad. We want to build it up, right? So if I'm like, hey, hey, Susie, so this is only if you don't have the ability to do steps one and two. You want to always try. But hey, Susie, so here's what I was noticing uh, with your deadlifts, right? So, and then you can go into it, right? <clears throat> you were, you were, as you were coming down, it looked like maybe we lost a little bit. And this is why I say, it looks like maybe we, and I make it we, I'm usually right next to there right? That person, because I'm making it a collective, like we're working on this together. It's a relationship. We're trying to improve your form together. Okay. And then I'm going to request works extremely well. So, all right, Susie. So it looks like when you were doing your, your deadlift from what I was kind of able to see there, I noticed that your shoulders would slightly come down towards the end. And I know it's, it's rocking because you're super heavy. So what I would like to try, right? Let's try it is trying. We want them to consider. Would you consider is the best line you can ever use with any kind of significant other boss or, you know, anything you're trying to just buy yourself time or you're trying to open up a deeper conversation and not offend someone, right? And you just want to make it a positive experience. Hey, would you consider helping me figure out a better um, time for this meeting? When really, I just want to say, no, I can't do this meeting, like figure out a different time. That's rude. That's a little direct. Maybe that works for you. Usually it doesn't. Hey, would you consider taking a look at schedules and seeing if we could do it a different time? I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you to just to consider it. And then you're going to say yes, because that's what we all do, right? We all say yes. And then we have an opportunity to make it better for both of us. So within this world, we have a better opportunity to get our point across that we're trying to without just like dictating and telling and keeping her under our wraps. And we're the knowledgeable coach. No, screw that. Like we're all in this together. Right. And so I'm going to say, all right, so let's try on your next set. Think bending the bar, 
right? And then I'm going to go into the cues of whatever it is. I'm just asking her to try. And then I'm going to give her the why. And this is this last part here where it's so that, right? So that, so that, so that. So here's what we're going to do, Susie. So I, I think if we can try to bend that bar in half, that's going to keep your lats on. Back's going to be so much happier as it's flat on the way down so that we can stay in the glutes and the hamstrings on the RDL and not feel it as much in our lower back. So that you can feel it here and not here. And really all you're going to do is with that so that is just to go and emphasize whatever positive aspect they're trying to achieve with working with you. So if they came to you with lower back pain, boom, I just found the ticket. Now she's got trust that I know how to coach and cue her based on her best interest because this move is specific when it's done right to help build the hamstring so she doesn't hurt her back. Yes, she's like, sign me up. This is great. I definitely want to learn how to do this. And you're going, yeah, I want you to learn how to do this because you're going to be successful. You'll get amazing results and you'll feel great. Okay. So recap, you're going to try and identify what things you noticed, right? Then you're going to ask them which rep felt the best or how that feel or like what felt the worst, right? Then you're going to recap. Okay, cool. Yeah. So what I heard you say was the, this, and then you're going to give it to them in a slightly more technical term or using the cues that you have given them so that that way you're just teaching them those same cues again, right? And you can also be, you know, another way is wonderful. Yeah, I agree. And here's what I saw, right? So if they're like, well, I felt like it was really solid. Wonderful. Like, I agree. You're agreeing that they think it feels solid. <laughs> here's what I saw. I noticed you were doing blah, blah, blah. Let's try on our next set to do this so that, boom, happy client, life is good after the adjustment. So now I challenge you to go through all of the different movements, patterns more than anything else, and role play with someone as you give them feedback on their moves, on their cues, right? Come up with those cues. And if you do those two things, if you come up with your, your ability to demo really, those three things, your ability to demo exercises really well and know what your cues are that you're going to coach during your demos, you actually <clears throat> write down what your coaching cues are for all of your main movements. And then you actually just role play how to have these conversations. You're going to nail this. You're going to nail this. It's going to take some time, but you're going to nail this, right? So with this last piece, I want to touch base what we didn't get a chance in the last section to do too much, um, but uh, but I find it really important, right? So I don't have, I have the document here, so forgive me. But it's the six foundational movement patterns, right? Now, we have a squat, we have a hinge, we have a push, we have a row. So it's really a pull, right? If we're looking at it in that regard, so just treat it from this, right? And then we have a single leg or a lunge, so if we're looking at it from the true way to define this, we're gonna make this work. We're just gonna make this good, okay? And then we have a loaded carry. These are the six foundational movement patterns. And if you look at 80% of all the exercises, at the current time of recording this, we've got just over 1,400 exercises within our app and database. Almost all of them are just this. <coughs> Too big of a <coughs> I'm dying now. <coughs> That's what I get. <coughs> All right. So it's just funny. I love making fun of myself. <coughs> Sorry, you're listening to copy on here. Um, but ultimately every every one of those moves pretty much relates to any one of these six behaviors. And so if you know how to coach and cue and demo a squat. Now you just have variations of said squat. I have barbell back squat, barbell front squat, bar on the biceps, zercher squat, right? <clears throat> I have kickstand squat on the toe, on the foot. I know you can't fully see, right? <clears throat> I have a kettlebell squat. I have a kettlebell racked contralateral squat. I have all of these different variations, but... What do I have at my foundation? I have a squat. I'm still trying to create a horizontal vector of creating force to equal velocity to help me increase strength with just an exertion of force. So I know that I need to have a stable base so that my center of mass can move me vertically, right? So I know that the more that that center of mass takes me out further, 
the more it's going to change my body. But I'm still coaching a squat. I still know what that looks like. I still don't want rounded shoulders. I still don't want butt wink. I still don't want knee cave, right? For the most part, I still want the exact same things. So you need to be able to identify movement patterns, and then you can simply coach from there all day long. The hinge, you know that it is a bend at the hips. Now, whether I am doing a RDL, a deadlift, a stiff leg deadlift, a single leg RDL, a <clears throat> hip thrust, a glute bridge, it is all still a hinge-based pattern. With a hinge-based pattern, I know that I'm still trying to stay straight from the top of my head to the base of my sacrum, so my butt, so my entire spine is trying to stay neutral. So my cues oftentimes are going to be like stare six feet out in front of you at the floor because I'm not going to say, I want a neutral spine. I don't want your head here. I don't want your head here. I don't want you arching. I don't want you here. No, I'm going to be really simple. Susie, stare at that dot on the floor uh, that we should have like noticed and cleaned up. Sorry, there's a speck of something. It's like six feet in front of you. Stare at it the whole time. Let your eyes follow it. And don't lose focus on it. And then close the car door with your butt for me. So how simple can I make it? Now, she could be doing any one of those hinge patterns and I'm pretty much solid, right? The only thing that might change is a hip thrust. But here's why I think it matters to be like, oh, well, we need to always keep a neutral spine. If that was true, then why do we coach hip thrusts with a tuck here so we can get maximum glute extension all the way through and create a roundedness? Why do we coach an ab wheel by being rounded so that when we're all the way out, we don't go into hyperextension? So be careful of absolutes. Anytime that you find someone is like speaking in absolutes, question it. Because there's always a move that counters it that we really do need it to counter it. You're like, well, we have to have neutral spine. But then you're sitting there with the rope doing ab crunches where you're completely rounded over, which is actually beneficial, especially in this right context. You're like, never have your knees go over your toes, right? So when you're teaching a split squat, I want you to make sure that your shin stays vertical, your torso vertical, because our torso and shin angles usually match. Match in a squat, match in a lunge. This is true, right? Usually match because it's our body's natural way to run, to move, to walk through propulsion. And so that's why runners, right? They have their knees go over their toes because all they're doing is catching themselves perpetually in a fall step after step. A marathon runner has just become really good at falling for 26.2 miles without actually making contact to face in the ground. They know how to catch themselves in a fall for that long. So you're telling me knees can't go over toes. That would be really bad, right? If that is really bad, then why can I sit here and squat down? Yes, I know I'm not flat on my feet. And you can't, you're telling me that that's safe to do as a squat, but this isn't. This is even harsher of a position. And then I pick up my kid and I like stand up and I do this all the time. We do this all the time. So think about all of these moves where they're like, oh, never do this. That's horrible for you. Oh, you never want your shoulders to go forward. But then we do dips. So I think we just need to understand the context of the body and how it's designed to be able to stabilize and what it needs. And so I want you to challenge yourself and look at all six of these patterns and be able to understand a pull is a pull. A push is a push, right? All muscles pull by contracting, but that is their ultimate design, right? Lunge, loaded carry, et cetera, okay? Hopefully that was helpful. Um, we have so much more to dive into. Make sure there's nothing else I missed on here. Um, what affects movements? So your movements are gonna be affected by lo load, time under tension, center of gravity, center of mass, points of contact. I think all that stuff makes sense. The less points of contact you have, the more your center of gravity or your mass has shifted, your center of gravity has shifted, any of these things, it's going to challenge the way that the movement is, is going through. <clears throat> um, we're going to be most stable when our joints are stacked, right? So if I have this arm overhead, right? And this is stacked over this, it's stacked over this, it's stacked over this, right? It's wrist over elbow, over shoulder, over hip, over knee, over foot. That's going to be more stable, right? Than me trying to split stance, raise an arm like this. I'm not stable at all. It's way there. It's not stacked. It's you get what I'm saying here. It's pretty simple stuff to kind of understand. Um, yeah, specific modifiers. I think it's pretty understand. Easy to understand half kneeling, tall kneeling. You can refer to this. They're just different stances that we can find ourselves in. The more contact with the ground or a bench, right? The more stable we are. So therefore, the more force we can exert. It's why you can, you can hack squat more than you can traditionally squat because your back is on a pad, so you've taken your need to stabilize your pelvis out of this equation. 
and you just have to push the pad, the floor, the uh, flat surface, whatever it is that's used with all the weights on it away or push your body away from it. But you're not having to use any more of your body's function, right, to stabilize anymore. Now you just press. So they're, they're pretty simple things to understand. If you want to make it harder, you just take stabilization away. You want to make it easier, you just, uh, you know, add more stability within that regard. But this does not mean that you need to stand one foot on a stupid BOSU ball and juggle knives and be like, look at me, I'm doing strength training. No, like BOSU balls have their place in rehab settings, but otherwise we want that foot to make solid, you know, contact with the ground so we can actually build strength because strength is going to lead to our ability to have reactive fibers, which is going to lead to our ability to catch ourselves from falling, which is going to, you get what I'm saying. All right, enough tangents. Hopefully this was good. Reach out if you have any questions.